Section 2, 1743 to 1826. Chapter 5, Proof in the Poetry. This is the way life works. Things grow and change, or at least things seem to change. Sometimes the change is in name only. Sometimes there's a fundamental shift, but most times it's a bit of both. In the mid-1700s, after Cotton Mather's death, and in the midst of his followers continuing his legacy, the new America entered what we now call the Enlightenment era. Enlightenment. What does it mean? Well, according to our pals Merriam and Webster, enlightenment is defined as the act or means of enlightening, the state of being enlightened. Isn't it funny how every teacher has always told you not to define a word by using the word in the definition? Hey, next time, just say, if the folks who wrote the dictionary can do it, so can I. <clears throat> but to be enlightened just means to be informed, to be free from ignorance. So this new movement, the Enlightenment, was megaphoning the fact that there was a new generation, a new era that knew more, better thinkers, and in America, the leader of this Better Thinkers movement was Mr. $100 Bill himself, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin started a club called the American Philosophical Society in 1743 in Philadelphia. It was modeled after the Royal Society in England and served as basically a club for smart white people, thinkers, philosophers, and racists. See, in the Enlightenment era, light was seen as a metaphor for intelligence, think I see the light, and also whiteness, think opposite of dark. And this is what Franklin was bringing to America through his club of ingenious fools. And one of those walking contradictions was Thomas Jefferson. About Jefferson. You know how I said Gomes Eanes de Zarara was the world's first racist? Well, Thomas Jefferson might have been the world's first white person to say, I have black friends. I don't know if that's true, but I'm willing to make the bet. He was raised non-religious in a house where Native Americans were house guests and black people, though slaves, were his friends as far as he could tell. As a young man, he didn't think of them as less or consider slavery much at all. As a matter of fact, Jefferson didn't even really see them as slaves. It wasn't until he, was, until he was older when his African friends started telling him about the horrors of slavery, including the terror in his own home, that he realized their lives were more difficult, different than he'd ever known. And how could they not be? <clears throat> his father owned the second largest number of enslaved people in Albemarle County, Virginia. And I don't know about you, but I don't own my friends. As Thomas Jefferson grew up, he studied law to grapple with anti-racist thought. Yes, the slave owner was studying anti-racism. He eventually went on to build his own plantation in Charlottesville, Virginia, putting money over morals, a lesson learned from his father. Slavery wasn't about people, it was about profit, business. I often wonder if there were times on Jefferson's plantation when one of his slaves, one of his friends, taught him things he couldn't learn from the American Philosophical Society. And if so, if that particular slave was seen as someone, something different, like a super black, and if his I have black friends was ever followed up with, you're not like the rest of them. And if when Jefferson's friends came over, he had that slave showcase his intelligence or his talent or whatever special thing he thought only white people could do. Because up the coast in Boston, during the time that Jefferson was building his plantation, a young woman named Phyllis Wheatley was under a microscope for being special. Not like literally under a microscope. She was too big for that. Not microscopic at all. As a matter of fact, she was being studied not because she was small, but rather because she had an intellectual and creative bigness that white people couldn't believe. She was a poet. But before she was a poet, she was a young girl, a captive, brought over on a ship from Sen Senegambia. She was purchased by the Wheatley family, who wanted a daughter to replace the one they'd lost. Phyllis would be that stand-in. And because she was a daughter, she was actually never a working slave and was even homeschooled. 
By 11, she'd written her first poem. By 12, she could read Greek and Latin classics, English literature, and the Bible. That same year, she also published her first poem. By 15, she'd written a poem about wanting to go to Harvard, which was all male and all white. By 19, she began gathering her poems into a collection, a book. By now, you know, there was no way she was going to get published, at least not without jumping through some serious hoops. So in 1772, John Wheatley, Phyllis's adoptive father, got 18 of the smartest men in America together in Boston so that they could test her, see if a black person could really be as intelligent and literate as Phyllis, as they were. And of course, she answered every question correctly and proved herself human. Still, no one would publish her. I mean, those 18 men knew she was brilliant, but none of them were publishers. And even if they were, why would they risk their businesses by publishing a black girl in the midst of a racist world where poetry was for and by rich white people? But Wheatley's achievements still proved a point that black people weren't dumb. And this information became ammo for people who were anti-slavery. People like Benjamin Rush, a physician from Philadelphia, who wrote a pamphlet saying that black people weren't born savages, but instead were made savages by slavery. Record scratch, pause. Okay, let's just get something straight because this is an argument you will hear over and over again through life. I hope not, but probably. To say that slavery, or in today's time, poverty, makes Black people animals or subhuman is racist. I know, I know, it seems to be coming from a good place. Like when people say, you're cute, for a insert physical attribute that shouldn't be used as an insult, but is definitely used as an insult, because it doesn't fit with the strange and narrow European standard of beauty. It's underhanded and still doesn't recognize you for you. It's the difference between an assimilationist and an anti-racist. Word check. So when it came to Phyllis Wheatley, an assimilationist like Benjamin Rush argued that she was intelligent only because she'd never really been a slave, i.e. slavery makes you dumb. Newsflash, Wheatley was intelligent because she had the opportunity to learn and wasn't tortured every day of her life. And even people who were tortured every day of their lives and did not have the opportunity to go to school still found ways to think and create. Still found ways to be human in their own way. Although their poetry looked different, although they did not often have the opportunity to write their poetry. See how that works, Mr. Rush? Mr. Enlightened? Huh? Yeah. Thanks, but no thanks. While Rush was working to make this argument, Wheatley was over in London being trotted around like a superstar. The British would go on to publish her work. Not only would they publish her a year after slavery was abolished in England, they would use her and Rush's pamphlet as a way to condemn American slavery. Let me explain why that was a big deal. It's basically your mother telling you she's not mad, but she's disappointed in you. Remember, America was made up of a bunch of Europeans, specifically British people. They still owned America. It was their home away from home, hence New England. The British disapproved. The British disapproval applied pressure to the American slavery system, which was the American economic system. And in order for America to feel comfortable with continuing slavery, they had to get away from, break free of Britain once and for all. Chapter six, time out. A quick recap of racist ideas so far. Number one, Africans are savages because Africa is hot and extreme weather made them that way. Number two, Africans are savages because they were cursed through ham in the Bible. Number three, Africans are savages because they were created as an entirely different species. Number four, Africans are savages because there's a natural human hierarchy and they are at the bottom. Number five, Africans are savages because dark equals dumb and evil and light equals smart and white. Number six, Africans are savages because slavery made them so. Number seven, Africans are savages. Note, you will see these ideas repeated over and over again through this, throughout this book. 
but that's not a good enough reason for you to stop reading. So don't even try it. Chapter seven, time in. America, or Africans are not savages. Chapter eight, Jefferson's notes. I know you already know this, but sometimes it's important to put things in context so they really make sense. Britain had ended slavery, at least in England, but not in the British colonies. America refused to do so. Britain looked at America as dumb. America said, mind your own business, Britain. Britain said, you are my business, America. America said, well, we can change that. And in 1776, before anyone could spell, we want slavery, Thomas Jefferson, who at the time was a 33-year-old delegate to the Second Continental Congress, sat down to pen the Declaration of Independence. At the beginning of the Declaration, he paraphrased the Virginia Constitution, every state has one, and wrote, all men are created equal. Bears repeating, all men are created equal. Say it with me, all men are created equal. But were slaves seen as men? And what about women? And what did it mean that Jefferson, a man who owned nearly 200 slaves, was writing America's freedom document? Was he talking about an all-encompassing freedom or just America being free from England? While these questions hung in the air, slaves were taking matters into their own hands. They were running away from plantations all over the South by the tens of thousands. They wanted freedom and guess who was to blame? Wait, first of all, guess who should have been blamed? Slave holders, obviously. But Thomas Jefferson and other slave owners blamed Britain for inspiring this kind of rebellion. He'd written into the Declaration all the ways Britain was abusing America, even stating that the British, though arguing against slavery, were actually trying to enslave white America. But remember, Jefferson agreed with slavery only as an economic system. I mean, he'd grown up with black friends, for goodness sake. So he also wrote into the Declaration the anti-racist sentiment that slavery was a cruel war against human nature. But that part and parts like it were edited out by the other more established delegates. Over the next five years, the Americans and the British fought the Revolutionary War. And while British soldiers stormed the shores of Virginia looking for Jefferson, he was hiding out with his family writing. Imagine that, the man who wrote the document that further fueled the war was hiding. As my mother says, don't throw a stone, then hide your hand. Jefferson was definitely hiding his hand, but he'd show it shortly after because while hiding from capture, he decided to answer a series of questions in writing from a French diplomat who was basically collecting information about America because America was becoming America. And instead of just answering the question, Jefferson decided to flex his muscle to tell the truth. He titled his book of answers, Notes on the State of Virginia. In it, he expresses his real thoughts on black people. Uh-oh. He said they could never assume They could never assimilate because they were inferior by nature. Uh-oh. Said they felt love more but pain less. Uh-oh. But they aren't that they aren't reflective and operate only on inst instincts. Yikes. That the freedom of slaves was re a re would result in the extermination of one of the races, i.e. a race war. Uh-oh. And the answer to the problem of slaves was that they should be sent back to Africa. So much for his black friends, huh? The ones he'd known to be intelligent blacksmiths, shoemakers, bricklayers, coopers, carpenters, engineers, manufacturers, artisans, musicians, farmers, midwives, physicians, overseers, house managers, cooks, and bi and trilingual translators. All the workers who made his Virginia plantation and many others almost entirely self-sufficient. Surprise, surprise. Oh, the best part? He didn't intend to publish these notes widely, but a small devious printer did so without his permission. Surprise, surprise. 
When it came to black people, Jefferson's whole life was one big contradiction, as if he were struggling with what he knew was true and what was supposed to be true. In 1784, Jefferson moved to Paris. His wife had died and his old Monticello home suddenly felt pretty lonely. He was exhausted from his grief and years of being hunted by the British. So he did what he always seemed to do in the moment of crisis, he ran to France. As soon as he made contact with the French foreign minister, he sent word home to his own slaves to speed up tobacco production in hopes that French merchants would could pay back British creditors. On one hand, Jefferson was telling his slaves to work harder, and on the other hand, he was telling abolitionists that there was nothing he wanted more than to end slavery. And while he was busy playing the good guy, promoting, defending, and ensuring that the French knew America was becoming America and also having a good old French time, back home there was a convention taking place in Philadelphia to talk about the new constitution. Turns out Jefferson's declaration resulted in years of violent struggle with the British, but more important, it exposed a weak American government. So this constitution was supposed to define it and solidify it. But before it was set in stone, there had to be a series of compromises. Number one, the Great Compromise. This one created the House and the Senate, two senators per state, House of Representatives based on population. The bigger the population, the more representatives each state could have to fight for its interests. This causes issues specifically between southern states and northern states because they aren't sure how to count slaves, which leads to number two, the three fifths compromise. The South wanted to play both sides of the fence. On one hand, they didn't want to count slaves as people, but instead wanted to count them as property because the greater the population, the more taxes you have to pay. But on the other hand, they needed more population because the greater the population, the more representation they got. And with more rep representation came more power. And the North was like, nope, slaves can't be human because the North didn't have as many slaves and therefore couldn't risk letting the South have more power. So the compromise was to create a fraction. Every five slaves equals three humans. So just to do the math, that's like saying if there were 15 slaves in the room on paper, they only counted as nine people. This three fifths of a man equation worked for both the assimilationists and the segregationists because it fit right into the argument that slaves were both human and subhuman, which they both agreed on. For the assimilationists, the three fifths rule allowed them to argue that someday slaves might be able to achieve five fifths wholeness, whiteness one day. And for segregationists, it proved that slaves were mathematically wretched. Segregationists and assimilationists may have had different intentions, but both of them agreed that black people were inferior. And that agreement, that shared bond, allowed slavery and racist ideas to be permanently stamped into the founding document of America. While all this was going on, Jefferson was in France, chilling, that is, until the French Revolution broke out. At first, he didn't mind the French unrest. If anything, it made him happy to know America wasn't the only warring country. But then it spilled over into Haiti, and that was a problem, a big problem. In August 1791, close to half a million enslaved Africans in Haiti rose up against French rule. It was a revolt like nothing anyone had ever seen, a revolt that the Africans in Haiti won. And because of that victory, Haiti would become the Eastern Hemisphere symbol of freedom, not America. And what made that frightening to every American slaveholder, including Thomas Jefferson, was that they knew the Haitian Revolution would inspire their slaves to also fight back.